Steel. Faith. Gunpowder. These are the three pillars of the Empire of Man. On the brink of civil war, the realm of man rapidly collapses to invaders that seek only destruction. If we can stand together, maybe we have a chance. But if we all unite under him, maybe we can even win. Welcome to the Campaign Mastery Guide for the Empire of Man, where you will quickly and concisely learn how to dominate on legendary difficulty without any cheese or exploits. Subscribe for other 20 minute guides, tier lists and more, all made with community feedback to provide a balanced perspective. Since 2016 with the launch of Warhammer 1, the Empire have persisted as the number one favourite, becoming the iconic protagonist of the Total War Warhammer setting. After a rocky launch into Warhammer 3, they've been tweaked to find their immense power so long as you have the knowledge to unlock it. Now first to understand the strengths, we need to understand the Empire. When compared to the Elves and Lizardmen, Mankind is a relatively young player on the block. Technology and gunpowder learned from the Dwarves and magic from the Elves. Mankind was facing destruction in the form of a green skin invasion until one man, Sigma Heldenhammer, would unite the desperate tribes into victory which would endure as the Empire. After repelling numerous invasions from different threats, Sigma would eventually sent to godhood, and the title of emperor would be one that is elected. The head of each individual state, the elected counts would vote for a new emperor, allowing for the strongest and best suited candidate to rise as emperor. But this is mankind we're talking about here, it ultimately comes down to who you can muscle, bully or bribe to being in your corner. But it always seems when times are the darkest, the right man comes in at the right time. Being so centrally located gives the empire a rich blend of culture and technology, and the never ending threat of civil war means all the states depend on being able to rapidly levy workable armies. And the first and maybe the greatest strength of the empire is their recruitment and replenishment. Losses are very easy to replenish with average troops with average equipment. Equipment. On top of the ability to bring regiments of renown anywhere on the campaign map, once you've controlled the county by putting your own elected count at the head of it, you also gain access to one of their specialised state troop units. These are more powerful specialised variants of existing units, but you can drop them anywhere on the campaign map once every 15 turns. As your campaign develops, the ability to reinforce your frontiers as threats emerge is very, very powerful. And this isn't even factoring in the excellent armoury building, allowing you to not only recruit more locally, but also globally globally across your empire. And those armies are going to be comprised of one of the most dynamic rosters in the entire game. Whilst the empire don't have too many matchups that are auto win, neither do they have any matchups where they have few options. The low tier infantry are very dependable and can be buffed, their cavalry is very good and their powerful gunfire and explosives will take out many late game threats. Couple this with all the good laws and magic you could ever want alongside battle prayers that'll boost your troops and you're able to employ combined arm tactics that can seize on the weaknesses of of just about any opponent. This right here is the reason why the Empire is such an excellent first faction for you to get into. You will need to understand and learn the different aspects of the game, infantry, cavalry, artillery, magic, and have them all work together cohesively. The Empire enjoys a stable economy, which scales very nicely as you expand, meaning your military can grow with you. And finally, diplomatically, the Empire enjoys great relations with the Elves, Dwarfs, and Bretonia. Those guys are right next to you. And the other elected counts, it can get a bit shaky, but you have control over them, and this presents a number of diplomatically safe borders, protecting you from hostiles. So what about the weaknesses? Well, the biggest one is that whilst they're not particularly weak at anything, neither are they really strong at anything. Most races have one or two S-tier style units, and you can really build your entire armies around these. The Empire just simply don't have these. The Empire do have some excellent units, but they don't have those ones that can basically win in 9 out of 10 situations. This is a combined arms army, and you will need all of your tools to win some of these battles. Now the Empire are amazing at mustering new armies, but the problem is they require upgrades from the technology tree as well as experienced generals with the correct lord skills to be able to perform in the mid to late game. Now while the Empire don't starve their peasantry like the chivalrous Bretonians do, their citizens aren't the buff hardy Cossars that live in Kislev. This is because the Empire citizens are their infantry. Multi-skilled people balanced in trade, culture and community, this only really leaves weekend to do some line drills so you will find their leadership and ability to hold the line somewhat lacking compared to some of their contemporaries. They will just need a bit of direction from a good general and prayers from their priest which will more than make up for their lack of training and make them incredibly efficient. 
Inevitably, when the elected counts go to war with each other for seemingly nothing, they've got the tools and the moves to get the job done. However, this does not compare to a career soldier. This is a medieval society, so if you are anyone, you're riding a horse, and if you're not, you're probably out of luck. You will need to upgrade their technology and put them with a general who has the skills to make them perform. Because of the aforementioned class issues, you don't get professional soldiers above tier 3 at all in the Empire. While you won't notice this early on, when you come to the late game, you will notice a huge shortcoming in your line holding. And this is important because these units are protecting your very powerful artillery. This means as an Empire General, you'll need to think your way around this, using priests and technology to buff your infantry, or using your elite cavalry to guard your flanks. And finally, whilst the elected count system can absolutely be used to your advantage, it does mean that you will be slow to expand in that direction. Rather than conquer these lords, you would rather confederate them, but this will come at the cost of time. The Warhammer 3 Allegiance system means that you can levy troops from other armies, so the shortcomings in your front infantry, just hard dwarfs. If you need mobile units, get some flying cavalry from Bretonia. If you're interested in playing as the Empire but don't want to be anywhere near the Heartland, you can go as Marcus Wolfhard on an expedition thwarting giant lizards and doing the old pastime of desperately requesting reinforcements and very slowly getting them. He specialises in archers and has his own racially diverse special friends group. Much closer to the main Empire but also in a precarious situation is Volkmar the Grim. Specialising in priests and flagellants, he goes around tracking down powerful tombs trying to get a hold of them before the undead do. If you own the DLC, you can confederate both of these guys and vice versa, but now let's go to the mainland of the Empire. If you're looking for a more challenging start in the Empire lands, you can choose Balthazar Gelt, the Supreme Patriarch of the College of Magic. Masked from the scars of prior experiments gone wrong, his faction specializes in artillery and wizards. A godly master of the law of metal, he can dissolve enemy armor into fairy floss and can be easily confederated by most other elected counts, meaning he's more suitable for an experienced Empire player because he starts on the front, right next to the Vampire Menace. Instead, the best recommendation is to start your campaign as the man elected Emperor by the other Counts Emperor Karl Franz. Since debuting in 2016, he has persisted as the most popular character in the Warhammer universe, boasting the charisma of Dwayne Johnson and the jawline of Henry Cavill. His grand appeal is derived from the fact he's never been too overly exposed, whilst allowing the player to roleplay as the hero mankind sorely needs against insurmountable odds. His home county of Reichland is a rich and excellent starting province, and in his right hand is the weapon this entire franchise is named after, once wielded by Sigma himself. His faction is is adept at diplomacy and logistics, and his own personal specialty, leaning menacingly over tables to make the ladies swoon. His most underrated ability is to recover and replenish troops in neutral territory. In the following section we'll go over the geopolitical mastery required to really dominate this campaign, but first we're going to go through the tech tree in my regular order from tier 1 up to tier 5 to tell the story of your campaign. Just a quick reminder guys, if you are enjoying the video, please consider liking and subscribing, it really helps out. Ask any question in the comments, I answer everything. And if you'd like to talk strategy, feel free to join the Discord. Cheers. As for non-legendary lord choices, you have the Huntsman General and you should only ever hire him in a crisis situation. Hiring one of them, as well as the basic archer unit, is an excellent crisis army to fill out a garrison, which typically lacks ranged units. This is the only time I ever use Huntsman Generals or the basic archer unit. Instead, invest your time in an Empire General or an Arch Lector. The General can fly on a royal griffin able to fly in and duel the enemy, whereas the arch lector is an excellent buffer of troops with his prayers which also stack with the regular priest hero. So at tier 1 make sure you are only a couple of provinces away from a barracks because the basic swordsman is such a step up off the basic spearman. Now if you played Warhammer 2, the ranged meta is nowhere near as dominant as it previously was. People that have trouble with the empire are usually doing one key mistake and that is they are not investing in their infantry. They will need training, discipline and research to get to where they need to be. I cannot insist enough that your first research should be these three infantry upgrades. Doing this will increase their leadership, armor and melee defense, all of which will help them hold the line that much better. If your infantry hold the line, your archers can fire shots over the top and cavalry cycle charge into the sides. The Empire cavalry and range units are already very good out of the factory. This also means I cannot iterate enough, make sure you put one point into Empire's finest. Plus 4 melee defense will do wonders for helping your basic swordsmen and more importantly spearmen hold the line. Better yet, I recommend putting 3 points into these basic units, then put points in your range units and wherever else you see fit. But the highest priority 
is getting your barracks to tier two because your two major workhorse units are right here. The shielded spearmen, which can screen enemy shots and the crossbowmen. Don't bother with hiring the basic archer. Wait till you get these. These are an excellent unit and can volley over the top of your gunpowder units when you get them. The Empire shields are a little bit lacking, only bronze shields blocking a third of what comes their way, but this is still a third less dead troops than otherwise would be, so this is incredibly important. The spear is anti-large and will fend away enemy large units, although later in the campaign you may need halberdiers to fill this void. Honestly, your crossbows will be able to handle anything at this stage of the game. You can support them with a couple of free company militia or Basilia cavalry. You only need two of either of these units, but they can add a bit of extra tactical flexibility. But just be mindful that these pistols don't have armor piercing. But the good news is, once you upgrade to tier 3, you will have access to the handgunner, one of the most iconic units in the Empire roster. It's not the best gunpowder unit in the entire game, but it is so affordable and so easy to levy so many of them. Having just a couple of these will really help you put the beastmen away, but to to take out Festus and any Chaos Warriors, having between 4 and 8 will really help get the job done. You particularly want handgunners before you take on the vampires because their characters are so tough. Gunning them down with focused handgun fire is one of the best ways to achieve this. If those slimy regenerating vampires keep on running away, then use the net of Amentok to keep them in place and then shred them with your muskets. This is done by the law of life, so tier 3 is the power tier for the Empire because you gain access to and can increase your cap of wizards. Most notable Notably, the Light Wizard. The signature spell, Net of Amentok, will allow you to pin a single hero in place and just target that gunpowder on them and they will just vanish. You can mount them on a very nimble flying Pegasus, meaning it's very hard for enemy missiles to hit them. They can just weave around, dumping down spells, and whilst the AI are better at dodging artillery now, just overcast the Net of Amentok by double clicking on it first and you will pin several units in place, left for dead for your artillery to bomb. Any heavily armored units that crash against your front line, just cast banishment and watch them get ground up into paste. The Law of Fire also gets a notable mention here, being very powerful and Burning Head can just shred through hordes of zombies. The other big name is the Law of Beasts. And that's for two reasons. Firstly, they get the unique Flying Griffin Mount, which is totally badass, but also the ability to summon a disposable Manticore. Yes, you can drive a giant flying beast into the enemy ranks, but this will hold an entire unit in place, allowing you to focus fire them with artillery or gunpowder. Now, because anyone of any class in the Empire ends up riding horses, Tier 3 is where the Empire infantry end. The best you'll see is the Empire Greatswords and they've actually got some good armour on them and can hit quite decently. Still, they don't have any shields so you, whilst you can bring these guys, you will often find yourself hiring shielded spearmen instead. Do not be fooled, this cashed up man of arms looks cool but he will really struggle against elite Tier 4 and T5 enemy infantry. Missiles are a better way of dealing with infantry and yes you'll take some losses but the good thing is you can replenish them with the Warrior Priest, one of their most iconic heroes. Any losses you do take, they can increase the replenishment drastically, so having one or two of these guys in your armies is almost an auto-include just for that, but more importantly, when you deploy them, hover over their abilities and you will see the 35 meter radius around them. Try to have a unit on each side of these guys. This will give them percentage buffs from all damage and get a great increase in their melee attack, allowing them to hit so much harder. Also, if you have an Archlector Lord, their battle prayers are the greater version, so you can actually stack this with the regular Warrior Priest to absurd boosts. Normally, while I recommend Malay Lord stay on foot, having a Warrior Priest on a Bartered Warhorse is actually quite good. Being able to rush up to any infantry units that are in trouble, cast a prayer, and greatly bolster their leadership to keep them in the fight for longer. I can't say enough good things about Warrior Priests. Fun tip is, hotkey them under the same number and learn your prayers to together with them so you can just rotate through your numbers and then routinely drop their prayers to ensure all your buffs are active. Whilst you won't find yourself needing to build the Warrior Priest building very often, it's worth getting one early on even if you knock it down just to get these guys on the battlefield. Whenever possible, you should be looking to build the resources or any weaving houses to upgrade your economy. The Empire's weaving houses are just such a good economic building, you should be looking to get as many as you can. The Empire Captain is a largely overshadowed and unnecessary hero. It will automatically put you on the Pegasus, but seriously, take him off that thing until he reaches tier 
at 30, you really need to give him a ton of stat boosts to make him work on this thing, but once you do, he's a competent assassin, charge in your flying Pegasus captain with all his buffs enabled and he will shred the enemy. However, what this army really needs is line holders, desperately. The captain does get the excellent passive, hold the line. This is something you should get on every captain and in general, providing invaluable melee defense and leadership to the front lines. Unfortunately, the final hero, the Witch Hunter, isn't much use of a sword and a flintlock pistol. It does excellent armor piercing damage, but it's not the line holder you so sorely need. However, they are very useful on the campaign map, able to block enemy armies from retreating or advancing, as well as being good assassins. It's worth noting here that there are a plethora of excellent Empire followers. Many of these do excellent buffs like increasing campaign movement and you can get these simply by winning battles in many cases. Make sure you turn off your research at the start of your turn so when you rank up you get a chance to get the research follower and switch your research back on before you end your turn. But even on your scouting heroes like the Witch Hunter you can load them up full of public order or corruption followers, allowing you to rapidly stabilize new conquests. While hiring one or two Empire Knights on your flanks will provide some invaluable hammer and anvil around tier 4 is when you will start to see them taper off. At this point you'll want to replace them with the vaunted Demigriff Knights, another trademark unit. This is a wealthy guy with a good amount of training on a large flightless griffin and they come in two variants, a shielded one with a lance which boasts better stats or one with a halberd. This is an excellent monster slayer able to chase down anything that gets around your back lines and I like to have two of each in my late game armies to protect the flank from anything, but arguably a higher priority is getting a tier 4 gunsmith to unlock the Hellstorm Rocket Battery, the signature unit in the Empire Arsenal. Firing multiple rockets of pain to nuke the enemy before they even get close is possibly the greatest pastime of any Empire player. Now, whilst the AI has improved and they are more likely to dodge the rockets, just ensure that you have these units stretched out in the widest line possible. They will definitely mess up something, and you'll see reports of people saying you should spam these. You honestly only need two, even in your late game armies. But two of these is absolutely mandatory because they will nuke even the most heavily armored infantry before they ever get close. Around this time, you should have several provinces leveled up to tier three. This is the point where you should start looking at building armories once you've covered all the economic bases. As you expand, you'll find new fronts uncover new enemies and being able to quickly levy an army is very, very powerful. The armory building achieves this because it increases local recruitment, but most importantly, increases global recruitment plus one, which is your ticket to being able to levy strong armies in the late game. Ensure you build a gunpowder factory in every single capital because every 10th building will reduce the global recruitment time by one. The Empire Logistics will allow you to recruit large armies late game by global globally recruiting your handgunners and shielded spears, whilst locally recruiting your heavy artillery and cavalry. Coming out of tier 4, the only exposure you will have is large single entities or very powerful heroes. Fortunately at tier 5, you get the Hellblast Volley Gun, literally a group of three miniguns that will absolutely eviscerate anything they target. I personally find a devastating and cost effective combo to be three Hellblaster Volley Guns sitting in front of two Hellblaster Rocket Batteries. Having this core of units will help break the enemy before they even come close, allowing you to dismantle them once they get into range. Now that you're in the late game, the rules for recruitment do change a little bit. Early game, I was certainly pushing you to put everything you can into infantry. Now at this stage of the game, you can hire demigriff knights as well as heroes to hold the line. So instead of investing in infantry, you can now ignore infantry for these new generals and put everything into demigriff knights, gunpowder and artillery. For your older generals, their army should be very seasoned by this point, filled with state troops as well as tier 9 units to hold the front line. So they should have an infantry force that's been trained up to cope. Have a few warrior priests casting battle prayers and there will be no worries. But when it comes to recruiting new armies, you may even need a steam tank or two. And this unit is pretty good. Be careful because it is fearless, it will stay there until it falls apart. But man, it will hold the line very reliably, allowing your gunpowder to do the trick. You only need two, maybe three of these, but if you are going to bring them, invest in the Lord skills because you can make them even harder to crack. So just in case you haven't cottoned on to the main theme here, the Empire units require a good general with good support units and a good overall formation to really make them punch and reward you richly for doing so. By far the most complicated mechanic is the Elected Counts mechanic and we're going to dive into that now. Now this mechanic is somewhat controversial but I'm going to argue here that it is in fact a strength for the Empire 
Empire. In Warhammer 3, every race is now slower at confederating, whereas the Empire confederate using Imperial authority, meaning they haven't been slowed at all by the shift in the meta. The Imperial authority system does mean it is slow to acquire other elect accounts, but also this means that they can't declare war with you, and you can prevent them from declaring war with each other, and that is very strong. So many other races have useless factions that will just infight or be uncoordinated. This gives you a lot of control, and no one else will confederate them, so you're not trying to race against any other elect accounts. You are the Emperor, take your time. As long as it's over one, Imperial Authority will provide a global buff to your entire faction. Also, every turn you get 5% to gain one extra fealty with the other elect accounts. By playing a bit slow in the early game, this gives you more elect accounts to roll the dice on. Once their fealty reaches 10, consider holding off on the Confederation. Take your time to build up some Imperial Authority first. If you deny the Confederation, you get plus one Imperial Authority in the bank, and you'll be offered this Confederation again in 20 turns. Because the biggest misconception of the Empire campaign is that you're meant to just confederate everyone. That is your second priority because your first priority should be to defend the lands and purge these areas of invaders. The biggest trap is confederating Telebackland in the middle of the Empire as soon as possible. This will greatly overextend you and get you into contact with the vampires as well as Draka. Because keeping positive Imperial authority is pretty much the only thing you need to do, but don't be surprised if on occasion you need to go negative to land a strategic confederation. And the resource you use to achieve this is called Prestige, which you essentially get just by winning battles, so you can just assume it will automatically generate so long as you're keeping busy. Quest battles are an excellent source of both prestige, equipment, and gold. If you take anything from this video, please let it be my 2000-2000 rule. At the end of any turn, make sure you have at least 2,000 gold or 2,000 prestige. You'll typically want to spend all of your gold on buildings and military, so try to make it the 2,000 prestige that you have. If you have no gold or prestige to deal with these encounters, it can actually cost you, but if you do have prestige or do have gold, you can purchase Imperial Authority, and this is the best way of obtaining Imperial Authority. Now, spending the odd amount of prestige on the other counts to help secure those trade deals isn't a bad idea, but try to maintain two 2000 prestige, often it's just a case of spending 500 prestige and you will send a group of mercenaries over to help out said count and you get to keep all the loot. It's win-win. Needless to say, it makes the most sense to back the counts that are nearest to you because you'll want to confederate them first, as well as the fact the ones on the far eastern end are most likely to get wiped out anyway. Just forget that they exist. Now, if an Empire faction gets completely wiped out, you will take a negative one hit to your Imperial authority. Make peace with the fact Hockland, Ostermark, and Ostland, those three eastern provinces are going down and you will take that hit. But this should be the only hit you take, and just simply don't resurrect them again so they can't get wiped out again. Keep the other counts alive and you should have no problem. That said, when you do recapture or simply occupy a race settlement that once belonged to one of your electors, you can opt to give it back to them and I usually opt to do this if that elector is still alive, but if they are wiped out, do not resurrect them. You're giving them a single holding in the middle of a war, they will get wiped out and you will take yet another hit to Imperial Authority. Why would you create another political opponent when they've just been wiped out? You gain one Imperial Authority for giving them their capital back and it will cost you three Imperial Authority to reconfederate them. It makes no sense, but where it does make sense is for the northern counties of Midland and Nordland. These provinces suffer endless Norskan incursions from the north, and this will just attract more and more Norskans to you, so you don't really want to be defending these. You'll need to rescue them from Kazarak as well as Festus in due time, but Karl Franz will replenish in neutral territory, meaning he can defend other people's provinces as well as his own. Keep them AI controlled until you've taken care of the vampires and Draka, and then snag them up for your at the end. Slowly confederate your way to the east and simply reoccupy these holdings the old fashioned way. Note that you don't need to hold the entire county, you just need to own the capital of that county and have an elector installed. This glorious affront to democracy allows each elector count to get this unique badge next to their name, don a unique weapon, as well as unlock that particular county's state elected troop. Needless to say, don't attack your other elect accounts. There's some really wacky builds out there where they do this, but you take a negative four hit to Imperial Authority, and it's just typically not worth doing. Even with Wissenland, where it might be convenient, this will give you eyes on the Wood Elves way too early, and you do not want angry Wood Elves. Make sure if you do uncover them, always give them a gift if your relations are starting to slip. Join their wars, get them to join your wars, whatever you need to stay positive, because they can easily underpass to the mountains and then ravage your land 
hands behind your back. Do everything you can to keep the dwarfs on side because they'll help curtail any greenskins and ogres down south. The most notable threats are of course the Beastmen, Festus, and Vlad von Karstein, who will essentially destroy half of the Empire and it'll be up to you to curtail him. But don't rush into this, try to take him on tier 3 once you have gunpowder unlocked. Draka can be a problem and she will wreck the northernmost counties, but with a bit of luck Kislev can keep them busy so you can go and remove Draka when you're ready. Around this time you'll have Norskins as well as Chaos coming in from the north. Done correctly you'll have Dwarfs to protect your south, Bretonians to protect the west, and the eastern side, well you'll have Kislev. Your campaign should roughly be finished by then, but you can easily defend any Norskin raids from the north and then start going in to take the fight to Archaeon. Now, the way I've explained all these geopolitical considerations makes it seem rather easy and rather methodical, but here's the thing. None of these things will typically go to plan in the order that you need them to, and you know what, that's great, that's why this is such an interesting campaign. All of the aforementioned advice will help you excel with any legendary lord that you choose. In addition to this, I have two tier lists and the perfect opening turns for the Empire. So, what are you waiting for? Get your Warhammer, pray to Sigma, and... Summon the Elector Counts!